Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the past few lectures, we've been looking at series solutions to ordinary differential equations. And in particular, we have focused those series around what are known as regular points. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to begin discussing series solutions around singular points. Now, we gave the definition of what a regular and singular point are in the previous few lectures, so I refer you back to those. But what we're going to do in this lecture is focus on the simplest version of singular points. In particular, we don't even really need to talk about series in this lecture. We will look at what are known as Euler equations. Now, in this case, I have some constant, I'll call it alpha x y prime plus beta y is equal to zero. So I have two constants. I just called them alpha and beta. You can call them a and b if you'd like. Uh, and in this case, it's a linear ordinary differential equation. It's non-homogeneous. We have the x's coming up. And the most important aspect of this is that p of x is equal to x squared. So these things have singularities at x equal to zero. They vanish at x equal to zero. Remember, this was the important criteria for regular points, is that they don't vanish at the point you're interested in. Okay, well, the question is, you know, how do we actually work with this type of equation? Now, we have a very, very specific way of solving these. It's quite similar to what we did with uh, uh, nth order linear equations with constant coefficients. And in particular, what we're going to do is try a specific form for the solution. Now, parts of this lecture are going to feel extremely particular. And that's because it is. It is extremely particular just to these Euler equations. But what you're going to see in the lectures that follow this is that these Euler equations keep popping out of something of these types of equations near singular points where we might have more interest. So bear with me through this, we'll look at it, and then we'll move on to the series that might be of more interest to you. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to set y equal to a polynomial. Now, the reason we are going to do this is because we know that when we take a derivative of this polynomial, we knock down the power by 1, and when we take two derivatives of this polynomial, we knock down the power by two. Now the interesting piece here is, we can see that in the differential equation, you have a power knocked down by one, but you're making up for it by multiplying through by x. Similarly, for the second derivative, you have the power knocked down by two, but you're making up for it with this x squared term coming through right here. So when you put this whole thing into the differential equation, so let's say into the differential equation, into the ODE, well, what I'm going to get here is r times r minus 1 times x to the power of r. Again, the squared the x squared here is getting rid of this subtraction by 2, and then plus alpha um, r, x to the r, again, the r minus 1 being made up for by multiplying through by x, and then plus beta x to the r is equal to 0. Now, you can go ahead and divide off the x to the r here, and this arrives you at what is known as the characteristic equation for these Euler equations. So let's take a look at this plus alpha r plus beta is equal to zero. And it's nicer to write this as a proper quadratic. I get r squared and then plus alpha minus one r plus beta is equal to zero. So it's similar to what we saw with constant coefficient differential equations, but the characteristic equation is a little bit different and that comes from the fact that this second derivative is not just r squared times the original function, but r times r minus 1, and then multiplied into this polynomial. But nonetheless, we can now do a lot of the things that we've already been doing uh, while we've been going through this. In particular, 
we can find the roots of this thing using the quadratic formula, right? Again, it's a quadratic equation. Life is good. So I get r1 and 2, the two roots of this thing. Well, this is going to be minus alpha minus 1 plus or minus the square root of alpha minus 1 squared and then minus 4 beta all divided by 2. So again, just applying the quadratic formula, nothing fancy so far. But here's the nice piece of this. I could have real distinct roots to this thing, right? So if I have real distinct roots, so real distinct roots, well then, I get two solutions of the form x to the power of r. I get y1 is equal to x to the r1, and I get y2 is equal to x to the r2. This is just like what we saw with constant coefficient linear equations, where we had e to the r1t and e to the r2t. Same basic premise. And in particular, we can see that these are in fact fundamental solutions because we can put them into the Ronskian. So let's check the Ronskian of y1 and y2 as a function of x. Well, first one, x to the r1, r1, x to the r1 minus 1, x to the r2, X, uh, r2, x to the r2 minus 1. So I hope you didn't forget how to do the Ronsky in here, just putting y1 and y2 and their respective derivatives in here. We're going to multiply across. We're going to do a little bit of simplification. And in this case, you get r2 minus r1, x to the r1 plus r2 minus 1. And as long as you actually have distinct real roots. So as long as this does not equal to zero, that's coming from the assumption that these are distinct, then this doesn't equal to zero for at least some values of x, right? Of course, you know, x not equal to zero is going to give me this thing not equal to zero as well. So that gives me that these two functions, x to the r1 and x to the r2, they form fundamental solutions to this Euler equation. Now there is a little tiny nuance here. In fact, this is only for x positive. And the reason for this is because I could have say r1 equal to maybe a half, right? So we have little tiny issues uh, when we start talking about uh, non-integer powers on these things. But you can just extend it and you can say y1 of x is equal to the absolute value of x to the r1 and y2 of x is equal to the absolute value of x to the r2. So this will give you this, the extended solutions. In this case, these things work for all x and r. This, so this extends you over all of the real numbers, okay? So it's the same principle that gets you there. You, this is just taking care of the fact that you, know, you, you wanna make sure you have real value functions. You're not actually taking you know, the square root of negative numbers. Okay, so now you remember all of that work that we did with uh, constant coefficient ordinary differential equations. You remember that there's a lot more than just real distinct roots that come up. There's another case that comes up. That is repeated roots. Now, if you remember, or maybe if you want to pause this video and go back, we saw that when we had repeated roots with constant coefficient differential equations, we got something like e to the rt and t e to the rt, right? We have this, this sort of multi, these polynomials that show up in front for every repetition of the root. Well, in this case, our solutions are already polynomials. So the question is, you know, what shows up in front? Well, let's just remind ourselves of something. So if r1 is equal to r2, then we have one solution, y1 of x is equal to x to the r1 only. And I can also put an absolute value around it for exactly the same reason. 
So the question is, you know, what do we have now? Well, you might want to go back to the to the, your notes to see what we did with repeated roots for the previous case. But I will ruin the surprise for you, and I'll remind you that what we did is we used a reduction of order method. So we said, take that solution, y1, and multiply it by some unknown function u, and assume that y satisfies this ordinary differential equation. Remember, this is called a reduction of order method. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you what happens here. So you can work through this, right? You're probably pretty good at reduction of order if you made it this far in the lectures. So what you can actually see is that this gives you x times u double prime plus 2r1 plus alpha and then u prime. Sorry, u prime. And of course, this is a reduction of order because the difference between the highest derivative and the lowest derivative here is only one, even though the difference here would have been two, right? So this is actually a first order differential equation. You can use separation of variables to solve this thing. You're also going to use the fact that these roots are equal, which means that there's no square root piece here. And what that effectively does 2r1, this is 2, and then times minus alpha minus 1 over 2, and then plus alpha. And so now we can see that the 2s are going to cancel, the alphas are going to cancel, and this really just gives me 1 inside of this whole square root. So essentially what this gives you is x u double prime plus u prime is equal to zero. Now, you can do all kinds of uh, fun work with this thing, and you can actually find that the solution here is given by, so u of x is equal to the natural logarithm of x. And I'm going to use the absolute value here again, because I would like to be able to put in negative numbers. But what this really gives you is it gives you a second solution to your ordinary differential equation. So it gives you a general solution that looks like this. So general solution here, y of x is equal to c1 times y1, we already had it, x to the r1 plus c2. And now what we have is the u term so natural logarithm of x, and then maybe I'll put this in brackets just so it's distinguished, and then x to the r1. That looks just like what happened with our exponential terms prior, right? Remember when we had exponential solutions, we multiplied in a t in front, and if it was a higher order uh, repeated root, then it got a t squared or a t cubed and all of these things. Well, here the repetition goes from polynomial down to logarithm. Okay, so you get a log in front of this thing. Okay, we're on two out of three. We're making really good progress through this. Now the question is, what's next? What is the last one? I've got real distinct roots. I've got repeated roots. You know what it is. You know what the last one is. You know it is complex roots. So we saw previously with exponentials, complex roots lead to sine and cosine terms, right? They, were, they gave us oscillations. So the question is, what happens here? Well, let's suppose that R1 and R2 are equal to lambda plus or minus I mu, okay? So lambda is the real part of the solution. Mu is the imaginary part. This is only going to happen if you have a, a negative number underneath the square root here. And the question is, what does the solution to this thing look like? Well, let's do a little bit of magic. So let's say x to the power of r1. This is x to the power of lambda plus i mu. Okay, so I'm going to use the plus root 
Same thing will happen with the minus root, okay? So we're gonna use this for exposition. Let's break it up into real and imaginary exponents. So we can distribute those exponents. X to the lambda, that's fine. Lambda is a real number, I can do this. But the I mu part is gonna take a little bit of work. And here's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna do a little tiny trick. Remember, any number is the same as e to the logarithm of itself. Okay, so what I did is I replaced x with e to the log of x. Same thing, right? e and log undo each other and bring you back to x. But the reason this is important is because it allows me to employ Euler's formula. Right, because now I have i mu ln of x. This is a complex exponential, and we know how to handle that now. This becomes cosine, and then mu times the logarithm of x, and then plus i times, sorry, the x to the lambda first, x to the lambda sine of mu times the logarithm of x. Now, if you do the same thing for the minus root, the complex conjugate, you're just going to get a minus here. Now, if you go back to the video where we did this for constant coefficient second order equations, we saw that basically our y1 becomes this thing, and our y2 becomes this thing, right? Because we exploit the linearity of the problem, we can add them together to just get the real part, to find that it's a solution, we can add it together in a certain way to just get the imaginary part, show that it's a solution. And so that tells me that my general solution, my general solution looks like this. Y of x is equal to C1. X, I'm gonna use absolute values so I can extend it over all the real numbers. I don't have to worry about positive or negative x. Cos, mu the logarithm of absolute value of x again plus c2 and then absolute value of x to the lambda sine mu natural logarithm of x so it's very very similar again but we're seeing the logarithm popping up right so the, this is sort of the interesting nuance that we see when we had solutions that were exponentials then the sort of next step down the ladder for repeated roots was polynomials. But now when we have polynomials as our solutions, the next step down the ladder is logarithms, right? We see logarithms popping up when we have repeated roots. We see logarithms popping up inside of the sine and cosine from our solutions here. So what we've done in this lecture is walked through the way to solve these very, very simple Euler equations, okay? So this is just a very, very specific type of equation that we can solve with a very, very specific type of solution. But we're going to see that a fundamental understanding of these Euler equations is very important if we are going to tackle series solutions around singular points. And that's what we're gonna come back with in the next lecture where we talk about the Frobenius method.